Over the last four games, Kay Cunningham has looked like the type of player that we thought we were going to see coming into this season. I want to talk about what is the key to Kay's success lately in today's episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. You are Locked On Pistons, your daily Detroit Pistons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's the deal? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. Per usual, I'm your host, Kuka Hill. You can find me over on Twitter, at Kuka Hill. I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. And if you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel, at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you are listening to this on. And today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster and easier. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. So I'm recording this the day after the Pistons loss to the Milwaukee Bucks. The score was 110 to 108. And when you guys listen to this podcast, likely you guys will be listening the day of the second game to the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, And in this past game against the Milwaukee Bucks, Cade played phenomenal. And going over the past four games, Cade has looked absolutely insane over these past four games. So I really want to dive into what I think has been the key to success for Cade Cunningham over these four games. I think you're going to see it for the rest of this year and possibly just probably for the rest of his career, to be honest. Um, We're going to talk about that first. And then later on in the episode, I want to talk about some things that Cade, not Cade Cunningham, some things that Dwayne Casey has done different, mainly the rotation, and a player, I'm not I'm not even going to try to sugarcoat it. Killian Hayes has to play better or some things are going to have to happen. We're going to talk about that and some, some other things that we've seen lately. But let's start with Cade. So Cade, over the last four games, is averaging 27.8 points, 8.3 rebounds, 7.3 assists a game, one block a game. He's shooting 49% from the field on 23 attempts a game, 28% from deep on four and a half attempts a game. And damn near 90% from the free throw line on four and a half free throw attempts a game. So the first thing I want to point out is the same thing that I'm going to continue to point out with Kay Cunningham. And I've done it for a long time now. He needs to be living closer to the rim, getting to his spots in the mid range and getting all the way to the rim instead of relying so much on that three point shot. That's usually when you see him become the least efficient in his game. For example, over the first four games, he took six plus three pointers three times in the last four games. He only did it once. And he's been way more efficient over the last four games. A three-pointer right now, at least right now, maybe in the future, but at least right now is not a, that big part of his game to where he should be settling for it too many times. So he's cut down on that, and look, he's been much more efficient. But of course, it's not just that. He has to find something else to work. And what has he found to work besides that three-point shot, besides just going all the way to the rim? His mid-range shot has looked utterly insane. And listen... I don't mean to be like, I don't want to come off as like, basically what I'm going to say is there's no way he can keep shooting like this from mid-range. Like the way he's shooting from mid-range is borderline impossible for him to continue forever. Like that's not, there's no way he's going to continue to shoot this well from mid-range for the rest of the year. He's going to come down a little bit at some point. But right now, man, he's on such a heater. It's crazy on how well he's shooting from mid-range. On the frequency, he's doing it. So per cleaning the glass, K. Cunningham is in the 98th percentile on the percentage of his shots that come from mid-range. So he is taking the most mid-rangers of just about any person in the NBA. There's, there's, there's like a handful probably. I'm going to assume there's probably like six, maybe six or seven that are probably like ahead of him in frequency of their attempts being from mid-range. So 98th percentile, 49% of his shots are from mid-range for what it's worth. But he's in the 98th percentile with that. You can take a guess what his accuracy, what he's shooting from there. For him to be shooting that much from mid-range. Now, he's not taking this one mid-range a game, two mid-ranges a game, and happen to make one, so now it's 50%. He's taking a hell of a lot of mid-rangers over the last four games, and really on the season. This isn't just over the four games. This is on the season. Again, 98th percentile in total shots taken. He is shooting 47% from all of mid-range. All of mid-range. That puts him in the 81st percentile. So just think about that. He's in the 98th percentile in the percentage of his attempts. He's taking 
from mid range. Nearly 50% of his att- of his attempts are coming from mid range. And with that, he's still in the top what 20 percentile in makes from that distance. No one else, I guarantee you. I don't think there's a single other person that's probably ranked higher than him in frequency from mid range and is shooting a better percentage than him. He's shooting a ton of mid rangers and he's shooting them at an insanely high high mark. It's crazy how well he's shooting from this the, the, the mid range. Not just from the high post either, from three to ten feet, from short mid range. From short mid range, he's shooting forty six percent. Long mid range, he's shooting forty nine percent. It it doesn't matter whether it's ten feet, fifteen feet, seventeen feet, fourteen feet. He's he's blooding you out. He's killing you from the mid range. And was something that I'm loving that I'm seeing from him. Not just the fact that he's pulling up in the mid range. He's utilizing the fact that he's six 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 seven with the seven foot wingspan. Even when guys get contest or when guys try to contest I should say and put their hands up Cade is long enough and tall enough to where he can just rise right over guys and he's been doing that consistently over the last four games he just rises right over them now he may get blocked a few times Uh, he even got blocked a few times last year trying to do it but this year he hasn't been getting blocked as much and with his length it shouldn't be too much of a problem for him he should be able to just rise right over guys he was doing a lot of this too with Drew Holiday guarding him now, Drew Holiday, I think you would probably say if you were objective, probably had the better of Cade in the second half. He did a better job of trying to control him in the second half. But the first half against Milwaukee, he he was doing this against Drew Holiday, who was one of the best defenders in the entire NBA. And he's just shooting right over him. He's manipulating the pick and roll. He's using great poise in the in the mid-range, hesitating, knowing when to change speeds, knowing when to sidestep into a, a, a sidestep mid-ranger, knowing when to hit his step back to the left mid-ranger, knowing when to just pull up straight off the screen. He he's just at this point right now, he looks like Kobe Bryant. I'm not even joking when I say that. The so far this season, K Cunningham has looked like Kobe Bryant from the mid-range. It's crazy. It's crazy how well he's shooting it. Do I expect him to continue shooting it this well throughout the whole year? Probably not. I don't know if this is even sustainable. I, if it is, you might be looking at one of the greatest mid-range seasons you'll ever see. Because this is crazy what he's doing. So it's gonna fall a little bit likely. But I don't think he's going to fall to a point where he shouldn't be taking them as many as he does. He should continue taking these shots, continue to operate in the mid-range, because he's going to hit them at a high rate. Maybe not as this high, but he's going to hit it at a high rate, and it's going to be hard to stop him because of his size. And especially if he's going to exhibit the type of patience, the type of poise, the change of speeds that he's been showing so far this year. Good luck. Good luck guarding him. And when he does get the pull-up mid-range, or the pull-up three-pointer, good luck. He's going to be like... He's going to be borderline unstoppable. I don't know how you stop him. I can't wait till he gets the three-pointer because the three-pointer is going to come. I have no doubt about that. Even against Milwaukee, he looked like he was putting more arc on it. It looked a lot better. I'm telling you, when that three-pointer comes around, I don't know how any team's going to stop Cade Cunningham. And and to think that I'm recording this and I'm saying this, a week ago, a week and a half ago, everyone was thinking, oh, Cade's done. Cade, Cade didn't take a step. Cade, Cade, Cade didn't do it, everybody. He's not. It's the 2021 draft class of disappointment. I saw a, a national writer ask that on Twitter. Is Cage not taking the next step? He, he's 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 taking a step backwards. He's not the guy. He may not be as good as I thought. That was after four games, everybody. Four games, and just the last four games, what he's done. His season average is now up to 23 points a game, six rebounds a game, seven assists a game, 45 percent from the field, 30 percent from three, and 85 percent from the free throw line. But yeah, after the first four games, everyone was ready to knock him down. Everyone was ready to give up on him. After four games, four. Kate is crazy, dude. Kate is crazy. Dude. What he's doing right now in the mid range is unheard of. I've never seen it before in a Pistons uniform. Rip Rip was great coming off screens, but he wasn't doing it like this off the dribble, creating like this. I haven't seen it, and I'm really young. So maybe there was someone that was doing it before that that you know before I was really watching the Pistons like that. But since I've been watching the Pistons, I've, I haven't seen not one person be able to operate like this in the mid-range ever. I haven't, I haven't seen it. It's, it's crazy stuff. I do want to give credit real quick to helping with this mid-rangers. Jalen Duran, heck, even known as Noel. And Stu, I, I don't think he does it nearly enough yet, but he's definitely doing a little bit more than he was at the beginning of the year of getting contact on your screens. As soon as they get contact on their screens, the defender's trailing Cade. And if Cade can just take his one-two, into the high post, just like you. That's how every basketball player trains it. In, in high school, when we used to do drills, in college, when you do drills, you do the little high post left, right. 
You go to the left high post, right, left. If, if you can get your one-two straight into a mid-ranger like that with your defender trailing, it's buckets every time. And if you can get contact, it's probably going to be there. You're going to force the help defender, the dropping big if they're playing drop. They're going to have to come up higher or either they're, they're just going to give it up every time. So they're doing a good job of setting screens and getting contact. I'd like to see Stu do it even more because I still think he doesn't do it nearly enough. There's too many times where he just doesn't get contact. But they're doing a better job of it and it's freeing Cade up tremendously. Cade has been playing phenomenal. And I don't know when it's going to stop, but, man, I hope it never stops. This is crazy stuff we're seeing from him. Let me know what you guys think about what we're seeing from Cade in the comment section down below or over on Twitter at Kuka Hill. That was a long segment, man. But, dude, if you've been watching these games, Cade looks crazy, dude. He looks insane. He'll be an all-star playing like this, even if the Pistons. The Pistons could lose every single game from here on out. And if he's playing like this, how he's playing the last four games, he's a surefire all-star. Easy. Not, not even a question. Surefire. Anyways, when we come back, I want to talk about something that Dwayne Casey has done differently and how it kind of – I'm gonna I'm gonna take it and kind of turn it into a Killian Hayes topic because listen, he has to he has to do something. He has to play better. We gotta talk about that because it's an issue right now. It's it's a it's a big issue right now. We'll talk about that when we come back. But first, I gotta tell you guys about one of our sponsors, LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be a hundred percent certain that you have access to the best and and, 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 and quickest qualified candidates available. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. You simply add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you are hiring. Simple tools like screening, questioning, make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. And it's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster and easier. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash LockedOnNBA. That's linkedin.com slash LockedOnNBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Again, this is why small businesses rank LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering Quality hires versus leading competitors. Again, make sure you head over to LinkedIn.com slash LockdownNBA to help you find the quality candidates that you need and need to talk to faster, easier, and for free. Terms and conditions apply. That's LinkedIn.com slash LockdownNBA. So I want to thank you guys again for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Lockdown Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you are listening to this on. That's another great way to support the podcast. All right, so I want I, we're going to start this off with what Dwayne Casey's done differently. So over the last few games, you've seen, I think really over the last two games, you've seen Dwayne Casey, I think it started in the second half of three games ago. But either way, Dwayne Casey has gone to a nine-man rotation. He's no longer playing 10 guys. And the odd man out has been Corey Joseph, which I like. I think a nine-man rotation is what you need to play. You shouldn't be doing straight up five out, five in lineups. Most people, most coaches run a nine-man rotation unless they have a, just a fantastic nine or ten uh, deep player uh, pool in your, on your roster. And you got if you can go eleven deep, ten deep of actual good players, then okay, maybe I can understand it. But most most teams don't go ten deep. They usually go nine deep. Hey. Some teams even go eight deep if they're really lacking depth. But either way, he went to a nine-man rotation, which I which I like. I think that's the right thing to do. However, it might have to be a different person that comes out the rotation if things don't start to change. And it might have to be Killian Hayes. Now, listen, you guys all know, everyone listening to this knows I'm a Killian Hayes believer. I'm rooting for him. I see the potential. I, you guys have you guys have heard me defend Killian and try to go on the record and say I think he can be really good in this league. So you're talking to this person. However, if he doesn't start changing things around, they cannot keep playing him like this. They can't. It's it's you can't do it. And it's not just for the team. It's for him. You have to save him from himself at a certain point. Because listen, Killian Hayes has not had a great first two years in the NBA. Right? I think we all would agree. Right? Everyone would agree that the first two years to his career have not gone how he would have assumed they would go. This is what his first two years looked like. He went from 35% to 38% field goal percent, so he went up. He went from 39% to 45% two-pointers. 
which is up first year to second year. Efficiency field goal percentage, he went from 40 to 43%, went up. So he was showing signs of somewhat of progression, not drastic progression, not big progression, but he was showing signs of progression in certain areas, especially when it came from the two-point area and around the rim. He looked better from year one to year two, especially as the year went on last year. He was showing progression. And that right there isn't even great. It wasn't that, That's not great, but that was progression. And that's what had people like me saying, listen, he's showing progression. It's going slow, but he's showing progression. Let's see if he continues to take steps forward. His splits right now are 17% from the field, 13% from deep. He's doing 18% on twos. Now, listen, it's only eight games in the season. Like, it is very, 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 very early in the season. So he can still turn this around. He 100% can. We, I'll keep pointing it out. We saw Sadiq Bey play like trash for the first 26 games last year and completely turn his season around the last 56 games. So it can happen. It's very early in the season. However, he's playing so bad right now. At a certain point, you're going to have to save him from himself and save the team. Because you can't have him out there playing this way. You can't. It, you, there, there's no argument for it. You, even a, a supporter like me, you, I cannot come up with the argument for why you can continue to play him with him playing this bad. I cannot. He looks like a shell of himself. Even you guys out there who are Killian Hayes haters, for those of you guys who out there who do not believe in Killian, just be objective with this for a second. Does he look anything like the player from two years ago, from the past two years? And mind you, the past two years, he was not great. He struggled the last two years, but does he even look like that player right now? He doesn't. I, I'm, I'm in shock. I'm in shock over what I've seen. He doesn't even look like the player we've seen over the last two years with his struggles. He looks worse right now. He looks petrified on the court right now. The first game he went one of nine, I came on the podcast. I told you guys I liked the shots he was taking. I loved the aggression. He was hunting his shots. He was taking shots that I thought he has chances of making. I loved his progression through those one of nine, that one of nine missing. It was the first game. I said, listen, I told you guys, the aggression has to keep up. Eventually, if you continue to play the same way, you'll start to have more good nights than bad nights. You just can't stop playing. You can't stop having that aggression. And after that first game, it's been – the confidence has went down to the floor. You haven't even seen him try to attempt the shots he, he tried to attempt in the first game, let alone the preseason. Preseason, we saw him trying to go over defenders at the rim, going into contact with the guys at the rim, finishing using floaters, posting up guys, then turning around with the hook. Like, we saw him doing stuff in the first game in the preseason that he hasn't even tried to do since. The last seven games, he looks petrified. The last seven games, he looks scared to do anything on the offensive end. Defensively, he's still fine. It is what it is. But offensively, he looks petrified to do anything. And you can't have it. Everything he's doing seems forced. Every shot he takes, I, I can probably count on one hand how many clean looks I think he's taken over the last seven games. Every shot he's taken is like a force. Every shot he's taken so far has been like a, oh, I have to shoot this. I have to try to find something. He just throws something up. Like none of these shots, he's not taking layups like he was over the last two months of last year when he was just getting all the way to the rim, whether he made or missed it, another story. But last year, the last like two and a half months of the year, when he was getting to the rim and attempting layups over defenders, he's not even attempting layups. He's not even going to the rim and trying to attempt layups. I don't know what. The player I'm watching these last seven games is not the player that I supported, that I believe that could be a good player. And you have to do something. I, I would consider throwing him down to the G League. And again, I I'm going to say this. I need people, to I need you guys to understand me when I say this. I'm not saying throw him down to the G League to save Killian. That sending him to the G League is going to save him. Now that's going to turn his career around. Could it give him confidence and maybe help him? Yeah. Could, could he go down to the G League and gain some kind of momentum and, and come back up to the, the pros and start carrying that momentum over and not play like a different player? Yes, it could happen. That could happen. But that's not why I'm saying this. It, actually, okay, it has a little bit to do with why I'm saying it. But the main reason why I'm saying it is because you can't keep playing him on the main roster like this. You can't. You If he's going to continue to play like this, you have to save him from himself. Not only is it – he's affecting the team, by the way. He's – the team is not playing well with him on the court like this because he just offensively, he looks worse than I've ever seen him. This isn't just he's missing shots or he's not shooting it well enough. He's not making anything. He's not taking any good shots. He it's 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 I can't believe what I'm seeing. You have to save him from himself. You have to save the team from him because he's hurting the team like this. He's in a funk right now that simply playing him 17 minutes and letting him shoot three bad shots 
is not going to save. He's not going to get better. He's The team's not going to get better. And there's no saving him from that. So I would pull him to the G League for like two weeks. I will throw him to the G League, say, Killian, take 20 shots a game in the G League. We're going to leave you down here for two and a half weeks. I just want you to take 20 shots every game and give Corey Joseph all of his minutes. And if Killian doesn't play well in the G League or he's not taking 20 shots a game in the G League, he's not being aggressive, you keep him the hell down there until he does. And if he never does it, then so be it. He doesn't get minutes with the main roster. But for the love of God, I think it, if you sent him to G League, we've seen him play well against against like back uh, 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 tanking teams. Where we've seen him do that. I think we all believe that he could probably do that. So if you can send him down to the G League, let him get some confidence back. Let him try some stuff that he hasn't trying in the NBA on the on the on the NBA floor. Let him get some confidence back. Let him see some shots go in. And then in two and a half weeks, then you give him minutes and see if you can keep him. And then when you bring him back up, if he's still playing like this, I doubt that. There's no way he can play this bad again. But in two and a half weeks, when you bring him back up, if he's still playing like this, you just bench him and you play Corey Joseph the rest of the year. But what you cannot do, Dwayne Casey, I love the fact you went to nine-man rotation, but what you cannot do is allow him to keep playing like this. You can't. You you can't keep you, – you have to save the player from himself and you have to save the team from him. 17% from the floor, 13% from deep. This is not the Killian Hayes that I defended. 38% is not good. 27% from deep is not good. 45% from twos isn't all that great. But for the love of God, it's not 17%. It's not 30. I think I could go out there and shoot 13%. You give me some open threes, I think I could shoot 10, 10%. That's one every ten mate and every ten shots. I could do that. I, I put it on. I'm put it on God. I put it on the Bible. I could go out there and shoot one of ten from deep. I put it on everything. I don't give a damn what anyone says. I could go if you give me ten open looks. I could hit one. I could hit one every ten looks. This is this is not. Killian Hayes may not be a good NBA player. He may never be a good NBA player. He may never become a shooter. But he's not actually this bad of a shooter. He's not been this bad for two, for two years. He's in a funk right now that he has to be saved from. The team has to save him from it, and he he cannot continue to play that well or play not that well. He can't continue to be on the court. You can't keep giving him minutes because it's hurting the team. You can't keep giving him minutes like this. Again, he may he may never be a good player, but through two years, he's never been this bad. This is not Killian Hayes that we know. The Killian Hayes we know may not even be that good, again, but this isn't him. This, this is a worse version that is lacking – every bit of confidence and he's scared to be out there right now offensively and the only way i think you could possibly save this is is setting him to the g league but you can't keep playing him he's hurting the team give his minutes to Corey joseph and instead of having him just sit on the bench have him get reps in the g league you have to that's my rant that's my killing hayes rant i had to give you guys one because this is this is this is bad this this is this is worse than i thought it could ever be this is the worst this is this is way worse then what even I could imagine to be like the worst, if before the season, if I told you guys the worst case scenario, this is about 10 times worse than what the worst case scenario could have been. I don't, this isn't, this isn't Killian Hayes on the floor. This is someone else. This is someone else in, in, in this uniform. I don't know who the hell is in that uniform, but it ain't him. It's tough. Send him to the G League. Let him get 20 shots up for two and a half weeks. Try to get the confidence up, back up. Then give him another chance to try to get those minutes back. And if he's still playing like this, you just bench him for the rest of the year and it's done. What you cannot do is continue to reward him with even 15 minutes playing like this. This is, this is bad. I don't think they'll actually do it. I don't think they'll actually send him to the G league, but Casey has told us that the G league should not be looked at as demotion. They want this. They want their G league with the Pistons to look like a way of development. They want to be different from the league. If that's true, you use it right now. You, you there is no better scenario to, than to use that. If you actually mean what you say, use it right the hell now because you need it. <laughs> you need it bad. My goodness, dude. It hurts. It hurts me, man. You guys know I'm a supporter. I, I just went on for 13 minutes about it. I had to rant, but I, it hurts. It hurts, dog. It hurts. I can't believe it. I, I'm in shock. The audacity. My, oh, my God. Anyways, let's move on from that. I've ranted enough. That's, my, that, that's what needs to happen. I won't talk about any further because – there's plenty of other good things to talk about, but this was so bad. It had to be talked about. This, this has been putrid. Anyways, when we come back, I want to give some credit to some of the other players that are playing well over the last few games. But first, you guys got to hear from some of our lovely sponsors. 
So I want to thank you guys again for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. Head to the YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button, or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you are listening to this on. I'm trying to like, who's out? I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring myself down from, from that last segment, man. I'm trying to, I'm to, all right, everyone breathe with me. Everyone breathe. We'll be straight. All right. So Boyan Bogdanovich is psychotic. He, he's Michael Jordan, basically. Like I, I'm not even going to dive into his numbers. You just need to know that that's the, the Boyan Bogdanovich that we've seen for years. That dude was a really good player. This is Michael Jordan. This this isn't Boyan Bogdanovich. This is Michael Jordan reincarnated. And and I, I don't know how the hell he's <laughs> – like looking at his splits right now is like, I feel like I'm looking at perfection. Fifty three percent from the floor, fifty one percent from deep, ninety four percent from the free throw line, fifty five percent from twos. Like holy shit! Like my god, dude, this dude it, he's playing out of his mind. I like it's been eight games. I refuse to believe he can continue to play like this. This is like crazy. This is wild type of splits. There's no way he continues to shoot like this. There's no way. If he does it, he'll be the only player ever to have a 50-50-90. <laughs> like, he'll be the only player ever. It's not going to happen. But even when he crashes down, he'll be crashing back down to from 50 to 40% from three. And even that's still the best shooter in the NBA. So he's been he's been fantastic, dude. He's He's been utterly fantastic for the Pistons. I couldn't imagine this going a better way. With Cade playing this well and Bojan playing that well, like that might be enough to keep. I don't know if they win many games still, but that's enough to keep them competitors or competitive competitive against teams like Milwaukee. They'll lose those games to the championship contenders. But if those two guys are going to play like this, they'll keep you in the game and keep it interesting for the majority of it. That's how good these two guys have been. Cage with the four past four games, Boyan for the whole season. Again, that that's number twenty three in that uniform. That's Michael Jordan. I, I, hey, ain't Boyan. I want to give credit to. To Isaiah Stewart. Now he's still shooting bad from the field. He's still struggling finishing around the rim. However, I'm seeing him start to use, I'm seeing him start to set more screens with contact. He's still he, he still is not doing it as much as I need him to. It's not doing it as much as he needs to be doing it. But it's definitely it, it's definitely better from the beginning of the year. So hopefully that's a progression. It, it continues to go that way. It, more and more each game, you see him get more contact, more contact harder screens, brick wall type of screens as the year progresses because that's really going to free up Cade. It's not just Cade shooting well. well it is Cade shooting well, but it's not just him having great poise in the mid-range. He needs his big guys to set good screens to give him that that lead that lead handoff right there between him and the defender. Defender trailing, he needs his big guys. And I think Isaiah Stewart's been doing a better job of setting screens. So I want give, to give him some credit there. Also, we know Isaiah Stewart plays really hard. I think he's playing extremely hard on the boards, um, and, and it's really paying off for him. So he, he's buying into that role. I like him to be even a better screener, but he's getting better at that, and he's giving it his absolute all on, on the boards, and I can respect the hell out of that. So I like what I'm seeing from there um, with Isaiah Stewart. Sadiq Bey, his finishing around the rim has gotten better. It, it has gotten better. His finishing around the rim, his, his, his percentages around the rim, I should say, would look even better if he took better shots around the rim. Like if he eliminated the bad ones where he just has no shot around the rim, his, his finishing would look even better. However, like for example, per clean the glass at the rim, he's in the 40th percentile. He's shooting 62% around the rim. Um, that's not, that's not, that's not very good. It's not, it's not fantastic. I should say it's right around league average. I think that number could go way up if he just eliminated some of the bad ones he's taking, but you can tell, Finishing around the rim has gotten better. He has better touch around the rim. I think he's using his strength a little bit more. What I would like for him to do is just be more consistent with what you're doing. Uh, if he could just go game to game with the same job, the same mentality, I think he could be even better than he's been. Just each game, I'm going to do this every single game. I'm, I'm going to shoot. I'm, I'm going to take these open threes. I'm going to get to the rim every single game. I'm not going. To, I, I'm going to cut out some of the sidestep threes. I'm not going to take some of the bad shots. I'm going to make better passes. If he did that, he'd, he'd take even a bigger step forward. But I do want to give credit to the fact that it looks like he has improved his finishing around the basket. Um, outside of that, actually, no, Jane Ivey is actually someone I really wanted to talk about too before we wrap up the podcast. 
I, he had 19 points against the Bucks, but the Pistons have to find something, and maybe they don't find something. Maybe this is just how it has to be. But when he shares the floor with Cade, specifically in the first half, I feel like he just goes, and it's not his fault, but I feel like he just he he kind of just like out there when Cade's when Cade's handling the ball, especially in the first stint with them together. And I don't know if that can change because Cade's playing so insanely good right now, like this. That you don't change that, and Cade's your franchise player, so you don't you don't want to change something that he's doing well at, and effectively affect him or potentially affect him by trying to help out Jane Ivy when he's on the floor. So I don't know if you want to change things, but they need to continue to stack with them, which they've been doing. I just think that maybe maybe they try to find a wrinkle or something to do with them both on the floor because too often I feel like Jane Ivy becomes like a basically like a ghost out there when Cade's operating. Again, Cade's been great doing it. It's resulting in great Cade play. But I don't know if like a – I don't know if a lot of fans are going to be too happy that Kate or that Jaden's kind of being what, – what's the best word? I, I don't want to say running cardio out there, but he kind of just feels forgotten out there when he when Cade's running the show. Maybe maybe no one cares, and, and maybe it's for the best for Cade to play as well as he's doing. Cool. Jaden will get his time when when Kate goes out and they stagger and he can run the show. Jaden will get the time then, and he'll just have to survive on catch and shoot attempts from Kate and 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 cuts every now and then from Kate. But I, that is something I'm going to continue to watch for the rest of the year. I, I've mentioned that now a few times, um, but especially with Kate playing the way he's played since they started doing this, like putting the ball strictly in his hands and just letting him run the show. I don't see how you really like want to mess with that while also trying to to like develop Jaden and develop his on-ball stuff, because that on-ball stuff is what he needs to improve on. So I, it's just something I'm going to watch for. I, I'm really interested to see how they handle it. Um, but, yeah, that, that's it with Jaden. I think Jaden has, has been pretty good to start his career. He's been really decisive in getting to the basket. Guys still aren't stopping him around the basket, and his finishing around the basket is insane. So I, I like what I've seen from Jaden. I just want to see how they continue to work them two, two, two guys together. But – that's all I've got for you guys today. Oh, the Pistons, actually, real quick. The Pistons should be damn proud of how they played the Bucks last game. Lost 110 to 108, but each guy out there, I feel like, besides Killian. Uh, Killian had a few nice passes, but oh, four from the field, zero points. You can't keep complimenting passing, dude. But everyone besides Killian, I feel like, had a part to this win. Everyone went out there, played as hard as possible. Everyone went out there and had a play that they made. They played really hard against the best player in the NBA, against the Milwaukee Bucks, who are now 6-0, and made this a game and kept it competitive throughout the whole game. They should be damn proud of how well they played and how hard they played against these guys. I don't know if they can keep it that close again against this well of a team, a team that could win the championship this year. But I, I think we should just give them credit for how well they played last game. That that was That's the kind of effort you want to see every night. It's not going to result in wins all the time. Probably going to result in a lot more L's than wins this year. But that's the kind of effort you want to see. You want to clap it up for that. I, I really want to give them a lot of credit for that. But that's all I've got for you guys today. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button at the YouTube channel. Leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. Thank you for making us your first listen of every single day. Enjoy the game tonight, everybody. Stay safe. Go Pistons. I'll see you guys later. Peace out, everybody.